Hare Krishna Raghunath Prabhu. Thank you very Hare much. How are you? Today. Yes, I'm wonderful. And uh, I'm feeling even more wonderful to have your association now. The, you are probably the most successful second generation teacher, preacher, outreacher, whatever word you want to use. Uh, uh, Creature is close. In the Western world. And uh, I think the way you have reached out through the yoga in the yoga circles is remarkable every year. You, know, you get high, scores and scores of devotees here to go to the Nico village as well as the wisdom of the Sages podcast has become, I think it's going to soon become, join the ranks of ISKCON history. So <laughs> you're kind Prabhu. Thank you. It's an honor to have your association here. Thank you so much. Thanks. I love going to the Govardhan Eco Village or going to Mumbai and seeing you. I always um, like to sit with you over lunch and ask you questions. I feel like I don't know very much, but when I get around you, I feel like a little, get a little bit more insight into my life and into my spirituality. So I'm, I'm honored to be here. Oh my God. This humility is undigestible for me. <laughs> but <laughs> Thank you. So Prabhu, I thought we would discuss today on the topic of what has been your life service say, uh, from, say, post physical yoga or postural yoga to devotional yoga? Mm. Mm. So can you so, tell about how you, you know, how did, were you interested in yoga from before or were you interested in, how did your spiritual journey begin? And how did you come to both yoga and yoga in general? Well, good question. The answer to that with everyone is by the mercy of the devotees, of course. By the mercy of someone who has bhakti, they can grant you bhakti. But I was on a spiritual quest from a young age. I um, uh, grew up Christian. And I knew that I understood the concept of good association and bad association. Okay. And I started going to the university and I didn't want... Good, I, I didn't want bad association because American universities are notorious yeah. for intoxicants and partying and illicit sex. And, um, and so truthfully, it w I, was, I, I felt drawn to a spiritual life and some spiritual principles. And so I was into an alternative type of music at the time, which was sort of underground, which means it's music you couldn't really hear on the radio. It was by a select group of people. They were all over the world, but mm. it was tiny. And so oh, it was like, okay. it was considered punk or hardcore music. That was the genre. And it later became very popular. Okay. But at Which the time I was interested. about right now, Bo? sorry? What's that? Which year are we talking about right now? Is this 1990s? This was 1981, 82. Oh, okay. And I was a teenager. And, and for me, it was part of... Which part? Of well, I grew up in Connecticut in the suburbs. Oh, Connecticut. Okay. Yeah. And my father was a school teacher and my mother was worked for the university. Oh. Okay. Um, so for me, it was um, a type of rebellion. And it was a way to sort of find myself in a culture of, uh, a, you know, United States is like an assembly line culture. You know, one thing when we go to Vrindavan and they say, oh, you want to you want a quarter? Let me take your measurements. And I think, oh, they're going to make me according to my measurements. This is for an American. This is like unheard of unless you're incredibly wealthy. You don't get your clothes made to your measurements. But in India, that's like a common thing in a cultured store. You come in, they sit you down, they get you a lossy, they take your measurements when I first had that done to me in the bazaar, I was thinking, this is incredible. But America, we've created everything. We want a, t a shirt, you'll see a thousand of those shirts, the same exact shirts on a rack, all different sizes, mm -hmm. small to extra large to extra, extra large. Everybody dresses the same. Everybody wears the same jeans. Everybody, And you know what's interesting in America? Because we own Hollywood, we've exported our culture to the rest of the world. That's why you can find American culture all over the world. When I first went to India, Indians look different. Now Indian cities, they, everyone looks American because of cable television. I remember when it happened. It was like 1991-ish. I was yeah, in India and I remember, started. I remember that's when satellite television or cable television happened. And I thought, boy, the Mughals couldn't conquer India. The, right, the, the, uh, 
the Afghans couldn't conquer India. The British tried to conquer India. They all took a shot at destroying and rewriting Indian culture. And they all failed. But this cable television, it's going to take it over quick. And you see, very soon, they set up new standards of what is normal. This is normal. Dress like this is normal. This is what love is. Behave like this. This is what romance is. Forget everything in the past. Forget about your tradition. That's some old thing. It has nothing to do with us anymore. We want to be progressive. We want to move forward. Look how nice America is. That is what is being sold Mm. to India. And it's being sold in an insidious manner. It sneaks right. You don't even know it because it's not an active sale. It's a very sneaky, a very um, uh, almost like uh, it sneaks in right behind you and it presents. And this is what America is great at presenting and marketing a culture as this is the way to enjoy the material world. Now, India's opted into it. I know. You know how many Indians I know that, oh, now I go to school and university in Toronto. I go to university school in uh, Manhattan. Uh, it's easy for Indians, you know, to get into these schools in America. Americans aren't so smart. Indians can be a lot smarter. You get into these American schools, and then all of a sudden they live the American dream. And then one thing happens. And that thing is they forget about their culture. They've lost their culture mm. and all the beauty that went with that culture. There is a beauty to traditional culture of India. And sometimes you don't appreciate it until you throw it away. True. And what's going to happen, and I'm sure it's already happening, is now they're going to, light is being shined on what America really is. We're a culture where we're damaged. We're broken. We're um, uh, exhausted. Why? Because we've had no rules. We've never had rules. We make up our own rules. And sometimes you think, well, that's good. That's freedom. That's why I love America. It's freedom. Yeah, but we also have the freedom to run down a hole. We also have the freedom to drive a car off a cliff. Meaning hmm. in the West, addiction is overwhelming. Addiction and groups, you know, 12-step groups, AA, NA, Alcoholics Anonymous, that people deal with this addiction. I, I, I'm sure in the last 30 years, you've seen the change. I don't know how old you are, but you look very yeah. young. But I'm 55, and I, I, and, I, and I know that there's been cultural shifts, especially in the major cities, with the consumption of alcohol and the con just the consumption of a Western mm -hmm. culture. And because of that, because it has shifted, you're going to have to pay the price now. True. Everybody's got to pay the price for that. Once you want to start dealing with Tamaguna and, Rama, and Rajaguna, that's okay. You can have as much Tamaguna as you want. You're just going to have to pay for it. And there's a cost. There, you have to pay for Sattvaguna too. You have to control. There's, a, there's, a, there's work in disciplining yourself, isn't there? There's work in a discipline. There's work in um, renunciation. There's work in regulation. But there's so much work in trying to get off of an addiction. That's a lot of work too. Everybody's got to pay somehow. So Prabhu, if I understand right, you're saying that you, you were sensing all this in 1980s itself. And now you are seeing all this unleashing all over the world. That was, you said you were a part of a, you started on this by saying that like you were a little rebellious. You wanted to go against the mainstream society. So was all this uh, like inquiate for you or you could at that time also sense the emptiness of, the culture around you? Well, I went through different phases. First, I just wanted to make music and I wanted to sing a very positive, uplifting message to the world. Okay. And, the, and the message was, it almost sounded like, um, the music was loud and noisy, but the message was very sattvic. It was about your actions give a result, the law of karma. It oh. was about you can, should control your senses and control your mind which is the Bhagavad Gita. So we didn't drink, we didn't smoke, we frowned upon illicit sex, and we didn't take drugs, and we were all vegetarian. And the, I wasn't a devotee. Really? How did you, these values came naturally or from your Christian upbringing or just by your observing society? I don't, society know. Around I don't know where they came from. 
Oh my God. I don't know where they came from, but I felt like it was a good thing. Yeah, it was a good fix. thing. So that didn't affect your popularity in any negative way that you didn't do? Well, I, th- I thought it would. I thought it would because everybody in that punk scene was into lots of drugs, heavy drugs, real crazy drugs. And they were also very violent. But we were very like bold in how we presented it. And we were a little bit fearless. And what happened was within that scene, another scene developed and it was called the straight edge scene and straight edge meant we didn't drink. We didn't smoke. We didn't do drugs and we were vegetarian or vegan. And that, that became really popular. It's still a scene right now to this day. Um, And many, many bands um, started from there. Um, I didn't coin the phrase and in all to be for full disclosure, I didn't coin the phrase. There was another band that coined that phrase straight edge. I don't mm-hmm. drink. I don't smoke. I don't F or a- have sex. Um, uh, but it wasn't like a movement. My band was called youth of today. And we sort of turned it into a brand or a movement without even planning on it. We didn't think that we're going to start a movement. We just felt like we had a good message. Life is short. Why not spend our time doing what we love, which was we had wanderlust. We wanted to travel the world. We wanted to create music. We were artists and we felt like we had a positive message. So we started that. We dropped out of the university and we just started touring with our band and the band started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, May I continue? I could tell you. So you were in music for how many years that we? The band went on for, when did it start and how well, long did it go? It, it went on only, it only went on for three years. And um, in those three year time, my father became very ill. Um, and it, it, it made me start to realize the temporality of life. And I started to search out spiritual books and the spiritual books would help me write my lyrics of my songs. Oh. And so some of the books were like of the Buddhists and some was the Bible and some was, uh, and some I actually knew people who were into bhakti yoga. And matter of fact, a lot of the places that we would hang out and play were the same places that Prabhupada went when he first came to New York. So New York is famous for devotees, devotees from all over come there or devotees have touched the lives of so many people. So I knew a little bit about devotees. Um, but for the most part, and I'm going to share all this stuff in my book. I have a book coming out about my life. Um, oh, wonderful. And when is it expected? August 22nd. Oh. I mean, I'm sorry, April 22nd, April 22nd, 2022. Okay. It's put out by the same people who did Radha Swami's book. Oh, okay. Mandala. Mandala, yeah. Wonderful. What are you calling the book or the name is still to be? I haven't decided yet. My editor said that a name will just appear. So I'm not sure yet. Okay. Um, but it's basically my life story and how I got introduced into Bhakti and how I went to India uh, when I was, you know, 22 and what it was like for me and my struggles. My, my journey home is different than Radha Swami's. Radha Swami is incredibly focused. And even though it may sound like I'm incredibly focused telling my story, I still had so many doubts and I still was fearful and I still had so much anxiety and I still wasn't sure. And I had tons of questions and it's sort of me sort of Pete, it's a different type of journey home, but um, I kept going on with it. Um, it's funny and sad and ridiculous. And uh, my journey was much different. You know, then I hear you hear about Radha Swami. He came to India. He fasted for 20 days. He ate only egg corns or and, you know, threw everything in the river. And mine was I was so attached to everything and I was miserable and pl- blaming God. Why am I here? So it was, it was slightly different. But in the time, you know, it was very interesting. There was a gang. And, you know, you've heard of gangs, They're like gundas, okay, you know, yeah. gangs. But they were young gang young like my age i was like 16 Hmm. and they were a gang and the leader of the gang was a very charismatic guy and this person heart was touched by the devotees so everybody in their gang was a strict vegetarian oh and everybody yeah okay so they were a 
<laughs> yeah, they were a violent gang, but they were they were all strict vegetarians. And then they the the gang started a band. And the band became were very good and very influential. But you couldn't quite tell if you were dealing with angels or devils because they spoke the Bhagavad Gita, but sometimes they did things that were really sort of evil. And so it, I was torn because they spoke about Krishna and I knew that Vedic philosophy had some weight, but the only people I knew who were into Krishna was a gang. So slowly Krishna started introducing me to more devotees. I wanted to learn how to eat healthy because I was vegetarian. So I met a Ayurvedic practitioner who is one of Prabhupada's disciples. And he started giving me instruction on diet and health. His name was Bhagavad. He's a sannyasi right now. He's with Prabhupada on his deathbed. Um, oh, okay. And then I met Yogeshwar Prabhu. Because this was 85, it was a house. Which years was this? This was like, this was probably 86, 87. And so you went to India and came back. It was after that. What's that? So What's you that? went to India and came back. No, I haven't been to India yet. I was still, this is time I was just in the band. I was in my band. I was on a spiritual quest. I liked devotees, but I didn't really understand who they were. Then I, you know, one time I needed to, uh, I couldn't have a regular job because at a regular job, sometimes they want you to work and your band has to go and travel somewhere. So I had this job working for myself where I would paint people's houses in New York city, or I'd, I'd clean their house like a house cleaner. Okay. And so uh, me and my guitar player who later became a devotee, Parmananda Prabhu, um, we would oh. just put up signs on the, on, on the, um, uh, we'd put up little advertisements on the, on, on the wall in New York city and people would, Pull, it, pull off a phone number and write our phone number down and call us up to clean their house. So one day someone called me up to come a few blocks away from where I was living and normal looking guy, nice hair, a sports jacket. And he looked at me and he said, are you a devotee? Because I had some Tulsi Kuntimala on my neck. And I said, and I didn't know what to say because I wasn't really a Hare Krishna, but I liked the devotees, but I like Buddhism. I like Christianity, but I would sometimes go to the Sunday feast. And he said, are you a devotee? And I just said, yes. <laughs> I just, I just said yes, because I felt like I'm a devotee of God. And um, so he said, okay, come on in. So we walked up the stairs and I saw these picture of Lord Krishna. And I thought, Oh, well, that's weird. And I walked up the stairs more and I saw a picture of Lord Chaitanya. And I walked up the stairs more and I saw a picture of Prabhupada. And I said, where am I? And he said, well, my name is Yogeshwar and we print children's books on Krishna. This is called Bala Books. And I said, are you a Hare Krishna? And he said, yeah. I said, what's up with the Hare Krishnas? Are they all gang members? He said, no. <laughs> okay. I said, he said, no. I, I, he said, Prabhupada was a pure devotee. I traveled with Prabhupada all through Europe. I met him in Paris. I was, you know, I met George Harrison I, and, and I sang on a record with George Harrison. And we, we gave that record to Prabhupada. And so Krishna started introducing me to other devote, devotees. Um, and then some of my friends became devotees. So after a while, my journey gets a little more and more confusing. But after the while, I fell in love with Krishna. And after a tour, I did one more tour. And I decided to go to India after that. And that was 1988. Okay. So I have so many people to thank on the way, uh, including uh, that first leader of a gang. First member of a gang. Matter of fact, I went and had dinner with him the other day. Oh, so the word I haven't really gang. Talked to him in many years. The word gang is it always used in negative sense, or is it just a group of people, or a group of people engaged in illegal activities or disruptive activities? Generally, it's got negative connotations. You can say a gang of people, but generally, it means negative. Generally, it means a little criminal. Notorious. Oh. Okay, so that's amazing. So, 
So when you went to India, you were still on a spiritual journey. You were introduced to the Hare Krishnas, but you were not really, you didn't count yourself as one of them. Not really, but at this point, I had a little bit more faith. I was chanting the Maha Mantra one round a day, and I was, I was interested in Vedic culture. I wanted to live in an ashram, but I still was not quite sure. I, I didn't read all the books, um, but I went and took a course called the Vrindavan Institute for Higher Education, and it was quite wonderful. And I had everybody oh. from... Donadar Swami to Tamal Krishna Maharaj to uh, Borijan Prabhu to um, who else gave those classes? Giraj Swami was also there, uh, I think, in the earlier years. Was he there? Who, who's that? Who's Giraj that? Giraj Swami. Giri Raj Swami, yeah. Mm. It was wonderful. We took all these courses with these great souls. And uh, for a new devotee, it really helped me learn the philosophy. I fell in love with the Bhagavad Gita. But I was still very untrusting, truthfully. I was still, uh, I still didn't quite understand it all. I still, you got to understand, for someone like myself, to move into an ashram is a huge step down of comfort level. You know, sometimes in, in, in India, which is a sort of a, a developing country. Some people move into an ashram. It's like, it's like a step up, even economically. If they're very poor, they, now they have meals. Now they have a place to live. Um, if you're from a wealthy family in India, it's, I'm sure it's a step down. From America, who's used to lots of comfort. We're used to air conditioning. We're used to you know, hot water, cold water. You know, I first went to India. There's no hot water. And the winter is cold. And the summer is hot. And there's and and everybody's walking around barefoot, and we've never squatted on a toilet before, and we've never put on a dhoti before. We never have to wear Indian underwear before. We've the whole thing is completely new. It's like rebirthing yourself. So I found it sort of like extra shocking. I had to become really tolerant, you know. And then plus there's diseases that you get that we don't get in America. I wasn't used to that getting sick. So how long were you in India totally? Um, well, I only went the, the first time for a little over three months. And then I ended up going back and I wanted to, I felt like I had unfinished business with my music career. Okay. And I, I, I went back to my mother's house, still practicing brahmachari life. And my mother lived alone in a big house. And I wanted to write one final goodbye to all my fans. And I wrote, okay. uh, I wrote a record called Shelter. And it was about my change of heart into Krishna consciousness. And oh, um, it, okay. it sort of became popular within the music scene. And then I became a brahmachari and I moved into the ashram, an ashram. And I stayed in an ashram going back and forth to India for six and a half years. And now, now I come to India twice a year, at least. Oh, okay. So, so you could yeah, say the so, 80s so, were the times when, the 80s were the decade when you started searching actively and through music and your journey in India, you found your path. More or less and, in, and in 1988, 1988, I started chanting 16 rounds. Oh, okay. Then, so when you said you settled in the ashram, which ashram was this? Where was this? Um, when I got back from India, it was Gita Nagari. Oh, okay. Then how did you, or since when did you start exploring the yoga universe? Or are there any other steps you would say in your well, you would like to share? You know, I actually, you know, I was doing yoga in New York. Before, that was part of my path as well. I started practicing yoga but back in New York in the eighties. All yoga studios were pretty spiritual. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, my teacher, my yoga teacher, was a, a Shaivite, and. Um, but he loved the Bhagavad Gita and Krishna. Matter of fact, he had one of Prabhupada's Gitas in his yoga studio. 
And I asked him if he thought this was a good Gita. And he said, yes, it's very, very good. And I asked him what he thought about the Hare Krishnas. He thought, oh, yes, they're very, very good. Um, and oh. so he, he's still alive, this yoga teacher. He's a very popular yoga teacher in New York. And he's probably 80, 80 something years old. Um, so was but, his opinion of a positive opinion about the Hare Krishna as reflective of the opinion of general yoga teachers? Or was yoga not that big in the 80s? And yoga was not big at all. So yoga those who were there were all. earnest spiritual seekers and they could see the earnestness of the Hare Krishna also. Was it like that? The only even reason, the only reason why I started um, doing yoga was not for health and not for wellness. It was for God. I wanted to know God. And so Ayurveda brought me, gave me more faith in Vedic culture. And then from Ayurveda, I got into yoga. I also oh, worked okay. in a vegetarian restaurant called Ahimsa. And so there were some yogis that would come into the restaurant and they would tell me, I'd ask questions. And then I would go there and do yoga. But really, I wanted to just learn how to meditate. And I wanted to learn how to understand God. And, I, and truthfully, no one explains it better than the devotees of Krishna. That's just, I mean, we say it's all the same and there's God in all spiritual truths, uh, you know, and, and in spiritual traditions, God is there. You can become very evolved, but no one explains it like the devotees can explain it. I, I'm pretty broad minded. I'm pretty like wide gated understanding of spirituality. I'm very accepting. I, I'm not narrow minded or exclusive. But man, we really have some great explanations out there. It's unbelievable. That's amazing. You know, this is one thing which uh, you could say that the, there's a difference between say, the 70s, 80s, and maybe the 2000, 2010, 2020. Now that there is, uh, there is a lot of, you could say, judgmentality about non-judgmentality. That means if, if you are not non-judgmental by my terms, if I see you judging someone, then I'll judge you very severely. So a lot. Of, <laughs> <laughs> so in that That's sense, at that one. time, in today's world, I think the spiritual substance of devotee sometimes gets uh, becomes a little too inaccessible because of the cultural trappings or the positions on social justice issues or some things like that. But maybe at that time, the spiritual substance was a little more evident for people who were seeking. Was it like that? Well, truthfully, I think now is the best time to spread bhakti yoga. It's more, more people are interested. There's like a Harry Krishna explosion going on in America right now. It's bigger than it's ever been since the time Prabhupada was here. Really? You know, it's only Sradhanath Maharaj mentioned sure. the same thing to me that. Who said that? Sradhanath Maharaj said uh, he says America is riper now than what it was even in the, in the, the counterculture time. It really is. It really is. Because people aren't as, the, the gross sinful habits are not there as much. And people are open. You know, back in the 60s and 70s and even 80s, be, because there was no media. Therefore, if you see some guy in a robe, it's almost intimidating. But now we have YouTube videos and you can... You know, you can go to Vrindavan on a YouTube video. You couldn't do that. Vrindavan was tucked away. There was no phone. There was one phone in Vrindavan when I went there. There was hardly electricity in Vrindavan when I went there. So this is what we have now is with the internet is you can look up bad things or you can look up transcendental things. And so I think the people are really ripe. They're really open-minded. The information age gives you the backstory about everything before you purchase, so to speak. And yeah, I think it's much better than ever in the 80s, in the 60s and 70s. People who were like um, monastics, monks, they seemed like weirdos to Americans. It was too weird. Unless you had, unless you knew what a monastic was. When I was 22, I saw sannyasi. I was like, who the hell is that? Who's that guy carrying a giant stick around? What the hell is that for? To me, it was just too weird. It's not weird anymore. It's normal. Not only that, is we have these second generation devotees, third generation devotees from Prabhupada's time that grew up in the culture. You got to understand the first Americans that got into bhakti, they were just totally focused 
on Guru Seva. They didn't know anything about Indian culture. All they knew is what Prabhupada said. They didn't know how to play the Murdanga. They didn't know how to play the you know, a harmonium sometimes or how to play the cartels. If you listen to these old Kirtan records, they barely knew anything. They didn't have the culture of the culture. Nowadays, these kids that grow up devotees, they've been doing Kirtan since they were children from their Janma. It's not their karma, it's their Janma. They're from birth. They're becoming expert at Kirtans, expert at dancing, expert at Bhagavatam and shlokas and Sanskrit. It's unbelievable. So now we have so much more to offer the world because we're sort of excavated a culture that would have been forgotten in a lot of ways. In the same way, there's languages that are almost dead. There's Native American languages. There's the Gaelic language. They're not used in popular culture. And after a few hundred years, no one will speak them any longer. They just become dead, almost like Greek, Greek religions, right? But, but I will say, uh, Srila Prabhupada and some other gurus, they went there and they excavated that which could have been lost easily. It's quite impressive. And it's quite impressive how the devotees took it and just ran with it. And um, it's so interesting to see how this flower will blossom. It's amazing. You know, it's just, I feel so much positive energy. I've talked, had podcasts with many other devotees. And of course, everybody is concerned about sharing Krishna consciousness. But at the same time, there are some concerns about what we are doing and which direction we should be going. But I, it's, it's such a, so refreshing and energizing to see your positivity. And of course, as I said, you have also been able to be successful. It's not just, uh, it's not, we could say, Pollyannish optimism. It's actually, a, uh, you have done that. So how did you... So this, I, this openness to spirituality or openness to exploring anything and having the resources to explore. Yeah, that's true. Like with the internet, a lot depends on one's choice. You mentioned one thing that the gross sinful activities are not there so much now. What, what did you mean by that exactly? Or it's like people see well, the I, consequences of those or what, what do you mean by that? Well, when I was young, to be a vegetarian was peculiar. To not eat meat, that was very peculiar. Now, veganism and vegetarian are in the conversation. People speak about it. It's a thing. Even if you go to Burger King, you can find a vegan burger. This was unheard of in America. The dairy, the dairy industry is crumbling because of the use of oat milk, almond milk, cashew milk, all different types of nut, nut milks. Um, because everybody knows the danger of this homogenized, um, pasteurized milk where you, you feed the cat. You're not even feeding the cow's grass any longer. So there's been a little bit of an awakening with diet and lifestyle that's much different than when I was a teenager. There wasn't even, people didn't even speak about diet. And, you know, it, it was a very narrow idea of people who thought, yes, organic vegetables, we shouldn't spray chemicals and herbicides and fungicides on our vegetable leaves. I mean, that was, that was a breakthrough. And there was only a handful of us that did it, you know, or the idea that, um, uh, you know, uh, problems with refined oils, et cetera. Anyway, all this stuff was tiny in the eighties. And now it's a very common thing. You can find smoothies or fresh squeezed juices or organic salads, organic food everywhere. It's huge. Mm. Um, so these things are not weird. If you say, yeah, I'm going out to dinner with a friend, but I'm a vegetarian. They'll be like, oh, great. We have a whole vegetarian menu cooked on a separate grill. And so that is just part of American culture. So, Amazing. Yes. So to some extent, most American, yeah. a lot of Americans are getting over meat because they realize they get to this point, unless they're really in their ego and like, well, I'm an American. I deserve to eat meat. But everybody comes to terms with what am I doing to my body? Is it actually good for me? And that, you know, I postulate 
is the thing that we can really stand behind and 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 wave the banner for better cho- better quality of life, better health and better consciousness. And the devotees have been doing it since the beginning. But now sometimes fashion catches up to reality. Sometimes it's not cool to be a devotee, sometimes it's cool to be a devotee. Right now bhakti is the new black. Everybody wants to do bhakti. Bhakti's cool. Kirtan's cool. Uh, cruelty-free, plant-based diet is cool. Simple living is cool. Tiny homes, reduce the size of your consumption. That's cool. Uh, organic gardening is cool. Living out of the city is cool. Living in the countryside is cool. Raising animals is cool. It's, it, it's, it, times are changed since the 70s and 80s. It's a whole new world. And now in Indians, I'm going to give a message to Indians right now. If you think you're going to America looking for that old school America, America's rapidly changing and becoming what India was maybe 100 years ago. There's an Ayurvedic medicine. When I first got, went to that Ayurvedic doctor I met, there was one book in America on Ayurveda by Dr. Vasant Lad. There was one book in America. Now mm-hmm. Ayurveda is huge. You can find Chavan Prash and, diff, you know, you tree dosha and uh, formulas and so many different uh, ashwagandha, so many different uh, these Ayurvedic herbs everywhere, everywhere. Why? Because times are changing. Times, and it's a beautiful time to practice box. It's cool. They have this saying in America, make, make America great again. That's the MAGA hat for all the followers of Trump. Make America great. We say, make Krishna consciousness cool again. It's cool. It's the coolest thing out there. And now I think people are actually realizing, like, these guys aren't weird. They actually have a very viable alternative, a very powerful way to live. As a matter of fact, we dropped the ball years ago with our farm projects. Now we're, like, running behind, trying to catch up with these people who are not, who, who are atheists, but starting communities, uh, conscious communities, conscious, you know, with shared gardens or farm projects or natural building, um, uh, building houses out of earth and cob and, you know, straw bale and super adobes. This is all coming uh, in, in vogue right now. Permaculture, water harvesting, all the stuff that, you know, Everybody from Bandana Shiva has been talking about and trying to like breaking her back, trying to explain it to uh, everybody in India. This stuff is all in fashion now. Amazing. Yeah, it, it is. is broad, broadly, what I noticed is you, know, you are putting more specifics. I thought of these four things, veganism, yoga, environmentalism, and uh, mindfulness. All these are becoming, they're quite strong indicators of the rise of sattva in the West. And within yoga that, is massive. Yoga yeah. is massive. Compared to 35 years ago, you can find yoga studios in every tiny town. And in a lot of those studios, they do chanting as well. Yes. So how did you, how did you choose to focus on yoga as, a, as your means for outreach and uh, also uh, you said you were in the ashram for a few years. And what, what changed after that? Why did I leave the ashram? No, not, not exactly that. But how did you choose? I don't think while you're... How did I change? Well, I was always a musician. I was, a, I was okay. always made a living playing music. And when I, be, when I moved into the ashram, I started another band. And we were all brahmacharis. Oh. Okay. And that band was called Shelter. And it was Krishna conscious punk rock. It was the same type of thing I did. Um, but it became really popular. And then we started to, traveling all over the whole world. And we put out, you know, you know, many CDs. We had a hit record in Brazil. We are on MTV. And um, in that time, I went through some dark night of the soul, some struggle in my spiritual life. So instead of Diving deeper into it, I backed away from the Association of Devotees. I felt like, you know what? I'm just going to 
practice physical yoga and I'm going to practice martial arts. And I got really serious about martial arts and physical yoga. And the more I got into physical yoga and studying the teachers of the asanas, the more I was trying to understand what they were teaching and to see if it was different than what Prabhupada taught. And what I realized was they just explained things worse than Prabhupada did. Prabhupada was very articulate. And sometimes they were downright racist. Like they didn't believe that Americans could even practice yoga because we were not born in a Vedic culture. They believed that Americans couldn't be, some believed that Americans couldn't really be vegetarians because they're not part of the Vedic culture. They were sort of like these smarta, caste conscious brahmanas or swamis or gurus. They think, well, if you're good in your next life, you'll be born into a Hindu family. Prabhupada crushed all that. He, he dismantled all of that stuff. And the more I practiced physical yoga, first of all, it was really good for my body. Um, and I really started to appreciate it more and more. And I started working on it hand in hand with my martial arts. And my martial arts did a lot of boxing, kickboxing, and mainly wrestling, Brazilian oh, okay. jiu-jitsu. And that's so, how I got on the Joe Rogan podcast, because me and Joe used to fight together. Oh, okay. Yeah. So were you into martial arts in your earlier youth also? Or this was the first, your first no, I got into it. I got into it when I was moved out of the ashram. But yoga I was into since I was a teenager. Oh, okay. But then I started getting really interested in very strong yoga. I started studying with the students of Batabi Joyce. This okay. astung, they, call it, they call it Astanga Yoga by Batabi Joyce. It's a very rajasic yoga. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So this was roughly 1995 or something, or which year was this? all this? Yeah, it was. Exactly. Okay. Amazing. And then... And so then, then, I, then as I was stopping doing music, I was thinking, what else can I do with my life? All I like to do is martial arts and yoga. And I, I mean, I'm not really qualified to do anything else. I don't really have any qualification. And then one day in my, and I did yoga every day, or six days a week for two hours a day. And then one day, one of the yoga teachers said, Hey, I'm, I'm leaving town. Can you substitute teach all my classes? I said, well, I'm not really a yoga teacher. She goes, Oh, you know, all this stuff, you know, you've lived in an ashram, you know, so much more than me, just, you know, just sub my classes for me. And I said, okay, I could figure it out. I said, but if I go, if I teach a yoga class, I'm going to play the harmonium because I chant before I, well, I'll, I'll teach. And she said, well, I don't know if that's going to work really good in Los Angeles because I was in Los Angeles. And I said, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I only chant. That's the only way I'll, I'll do it. And she said, okay, you can do it. So I taught at these very big popular places in Los Angeles and every place I subbed for her, I got hired. <laughs> I got hired and oh. literally overnight or within two days, I had a full-time yoga schedule teaching yoga. <laughs> um, and so that's sort of how I started teaching yoga. And then I started working about, because I, I'm a natural you know, preacher, I'll call it a preacher because I like to explain the Bhagavad Gita and I really try to think deeply about the Bhagavad Gita. And so for me, it's really easily easy to put the Bhagavad Gita and Asana class together. And oftentimes people want to hear some type of words of wisdom. In America, they call it a Dharma talk where you talk about right, rightful living. People like chanting. They like call and response chanting. And so I've, I've just arranged a class that what, because I was very strong in my physical practice, I would draw them in with strong physical asanas. I can mm. do handstands. I can take handstand to a bakasana. I can do handstand and come all the way to sitting. I can go from sitting back to handstand. You know, so my physical practice was really strong. And that's attractive to people who want some power. But what they get was bhakti because I'm into bhakti. So the more I got into teaching yoga, it started putting me back on my, um, on my spiritual path, which I sort of stepped a little bit away from. Now, in retrospect, you can see that everything, Krishna, everything you go through in your life, it's Krishna's way of moving things for your benefit. 
He uses your karma. He uses your choices. He uses your free will. He uses your intensity in devotion. He uses your fall down in devotion for your benefit. And it's quite beautiful. Like, for example, if I didn't go through that whole period, I would have never met Joe Rogan. Me being on the Joe Rogan podcast has so many people listening to the Srimad Bhagavatam every day. Every day they say, yeah, I just heard you on Joe Rogan. I really like the way you explained it. I'm sort of into spirituality. Now I listen to the Bhagavatam with your podcast, Wisdom of the Sages. That's our podcast, Wisdom of the Sages. They listen to it every day. And so I realized that even me pulling away from Krishna, Krishna would use that for your benefit and for the benefit of other people. And that is the beauty of bhakti. It's above our karma. It's above our good karma, our bad karma, our malefic planets, our, um, our, our good, our strong house, you know, in astrology. It's above astrology. There is no bad day. There is no bad karma. There is no malefic planet. There is no gem that's going to fix your malefic planet. There only is Krishna who's given you exactly what you need. And it's going to be different than your plan because you might have some other agenda that is not Krishna's agenda. Krishna has an agenda exactly for you. And it may not be exactly what you're planning. But it's perfect Amazing. because Krishna is perfect and your life is perfect. And if you don't accept Krishna's plan, you're just in the throes of your karma. I'm having a good day. I'm having a bad day. I'm going to a, a problem period in my life or a problem. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in a, I'm a planet is in a bad house or a, there's no yoga in this chart or something like that. You're, you're at the hands of your ups and downs. Our bhakti is transcendental to the ups and downs of our karma. Krishna is Yogeshwar. He's above these laws of karma. Hope that wasn't too long-winded. No, that's beautiful. So actually, we always talk about how we can bring a negative to positive and how we can talk about, uh, what do you say, transforming our pains or learning from our pains. But this point of how Sometimes our going away from Krishna can not only draw us back to Krishna, but can also give us some experiences that can further draw, can help us draw others to Krishna. That's remarkable. Mm -hmm. In one it's sense, remarkable. Yeah, in one sense, if you consider in our tradition also, uh, I've been studying a little bit of our tradition and contemporary traditions history also, that it seems many of the most significant uh, uh, developments happened at the fringe not in the center. Now, Bhakti Nath Thakur was not in the central power structure of the Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Mm. And even in the, the Iskon Chopati temple, which has the consular system and so many other things, that was not exactly the main, uh, that was not in the mainstream of Iskon at that time. Not the Bhakti Tirtha sure. Maharaj's projects. So in one sense, sure. you are exploring yoga and martial arts. So I was thinking how Prabhupada, when he came to India, India had many temples, but Prabhupada out even Indians by having at that time a full marble temple in Juhu. So in one sense, what Prabhupada did culturally with temples, you did physically through your yoga. That people who are interested <laughs> in power, you could excel in their definition of success. Sure. That is amazing. So were you always physically very strong and resilient? Or no, I was never really athletic. Oh. Yoga, yoga saved me. Yoga gave me strength. It gave me flexibility. It taught me how to breathe. It taught, I, I corrected my diet. Um, yeah, it was, I was never, never. Amazing. And um, overall, so when you said that you started, you started to do singing before the yoga, so was that also common? Or that was also not very common at that time? Mixing Kirtan. But Kirtan was also in, big in at that time, the 80s, in the 90s? In America, it was, it, it's a mix. It was mixed, truthfully. Some people hate it and they try to make yoga secular. Okay. And um, some people think it's cool. And my feeling was, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. Because I think it's cool. And <laughs> okay. sometimes when you just do what you believe is cool, there'll be people who will be like, yeah, that is cool. I want to be like you. That's how we started our band, Youth of Today. We didn't care if people 
didn't like us. We just wanted to do what we did. And we were good at what we did and people listened to us. So I could do the physical poses. I could do them. I could. So it wasn't a competition, but in that sense, I could do whatever they could do. I can do even stronger things than they can do. But I'm also into bhakti. And guess what? If you sign up for yoga class, this is yoga. You signed up for it. It's not like I'm a, on the street. I say, hey, you want to buy a Bhagavad Gita? Guy's like, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't. I'm not asking to buy a Bhagavad Gita. You're approaching me. But you came to a yoga class. This is the culture of yoga. And I'm here to give you the culture of yoga. If you don't like it, don't come to a yoga class or come to a class where the guy doesn't know anything about yoga. And he'll just teach you how to do uh, gymnastics. I'm not a gymnastic teacher. I'm not a coach. I'm not a, a personal trainer. I teach yoga. It's my job to disseminate yoga truth. So, you know, this is one thing which struck me that uh, you can be upfront. Earlier, you, you used the word what? Like wide-gated in your spiritual approach. So, mm. in one sense, you can be broad-minded. At the same time, you can be quite upfront about who you are. So, I, I, we, we don't have to conceal I, I, who we are. It's just that we don't why, have to condemn what others it? are. We have something so... It's like, imagine if you have this beautiful painting... And when people come over, you put a blanket over it. Why keep Krishna in the closet? Like he's like, he's like, he's deformed. Krishna is not deformed. He's very beautiful. He's charming. Why not put him at the main seat? Why not treat him like the guest of honor that he is? Krishna and Bhakti is incredibly cool. Oh. He's the coolest thing ever. Our culture is so cool. It's not like we're boring or closed-minded or um, racist or rude or cruel. we got something very cool going on. We've got great stories. We've got great food. We love cooking. We love, you know, we love a physical practice. We love the idea of pranayam. We love the idea of Ayurvedic medicine. We like Indian dancing. We love the murdanga, the drums, the music. We love singing. We love getting our ego out of the way. We love community. We love farming. We love simple living. We love festivals. Come on. What more do they want? This is the best place to be. You know, the proof, the way you're presenting it, it seems so simple. So maybe I'll just be like a wet towel a little bit. And where, where do you think uh, we went wrong or at one time in America, we were quite big, even in the Western world at large. But then, what, what, what do you, in your understanding, what went wrong? Why did we lose out so much? And now you're saying that we, we already have it. And in one sense, you are not doing anything radically new. You're only presenting, because I have, uh, I have attended as well as participated in your classes in Wisdom of the Sages. You're quite, as I said, upfront. You, you're not... You're candid, you know, you can be candid about your own practices, but you don't condemn anyone else uh, for where they're coming from. So, but where did we, where did we go wrong then in your understanding? And well, I feel like as a movement of bhakti, there were some things that uh, became popular. Now, Radha Swami has taught me differently. So if I have anything that was good, I got it from Radha Swami. We shouldn't lead with ego because it's, it becomes very obvious to people when we lead with ego. And it's not the way devotees lead. We lead with a type of humility, a deep woven humility that we are marginal, that we could fall at any minute, even Great souls like Brahma falls down, gets covered, falls into illusion. So it, with that humility, embracing that humility, that weaves really well in with bhakti yoga. If I'm thinking like, oh, you should give up this and you should give up that. And we're like this and our movement is so powerful. And, you know, it's almost like posturing. And then when the person has some internal struggle, who's the leader, they have to hide them because their leaders 
and they, they've been blowing themselves up as this very powerful leader, but they realize they have some internal struggle and then they have to hide it. And then they hide it for another year and another year. And now all of a sudden things come out like this person was never serious. So they were never practicing and it almost ruins everything because the person did have sincerity. But sometimes when it's woven in with our ego and it's a very difficult thing to become popular, but do it without an ego. Radha Swami is expert at this. He has so much power in his little finger, but that power doesn't control him. He controls that power. He doesn't lead with the ego. He leads just by example. And we all want to be like him. We all want to be like him. And he never asked us, hey, I want you to surrender to Krishna now. He just leads by example, and we all want to please him. It's very, very powerful. And I think when devotees get in an arrogant way, it works against them. And this other idea of the means, uh, uh, the ends justifies the means. I think devotees got a little crooked and pushy. They said, well, Prabhupada wants books out, so we're going to get people to buy books no matter what even if they have to cheat them or they do it in a, in, in a wrong way or be very pushy and people, especially Americans are like, I don't like pushy people. I personally, I don't like pushy people. I don't like people approaching me on the street that are pushy. So if, unless they had either a refined way to distribute books or, um, or they got, you get into Bhakti a different way. I don't like, I personally, a lot of Americans don't like to be bothered on the street like that. And, and why, why even go there when we have an entire beautiful culture that can be used to spreading the holy name? Um, I like what we're doing with Wisdom of the Sages is because we don't tell anybody to buy any books. They just listen to something that's relevant in their life. If you can make the Bhagavatam relevant in their life, and there's a million ways it's relevant, then eventually everybody wants to buy full sets of the Bhagavatam. You don't have to say, hey, you want to buy a book? You like yoga? You want to buy a book? They'll buy it. I don't want people to buy Prabhupada's books. I want them to buy it and read it or even just read it. I want them to read it online. Who cares if they bought a book and they throw it in the garbage or they bought a book and it goes on their shelf and your temple wins all the scores and it becomes this weird competition for points how about a person purchased a book and they're really interested in reading that book? That's a win for me. That's a home run. You know, that a person wants the book and they're really eager to read the book because I set such a good example for them to want to read it. It's amazing. So true in one sense. I, I appreciate all the three points that you made. That first is that coming off as arrogant, as holier, holier than Tao, in one sense, uh, I mean, whatever interactions I have had with Maharaj, he told me that the thing that puts people off the most is sectarianism in the West. If you, mm. you think that you, be, you belong to a group which is superior to other groups, which puts down other groups, then that just doesn't work. And somehow, even if we are not, some, some of the things which we do, can easily come off as arrogant to people. The very way we conduct ourselves or sometimes it is, it is so true. And that second mm -hmm. point which you mentioned also about this, uh, I've been noting down some of the points you mentioned that when you focus on uh, and justify the means, you know how much damage it can cause, especially I think overall what you are saying is we need to move from more a raj we, we are talking about Shuddha Sattva, but we are functioning in Rajas to some extent. You know, the yeah. the, the attitude of dominating it's in totally Rajas. It, totally Rajas. Okay. <laughs> we want the short term benefit for long term disaster. And we and we ruined a reputation. Matter of fact, mm. a lot of the times you have to like recreate or rebrand a reputation because there's so much damage to it in the past. Mm. So it's ironic. They'll say, oh, I know the Hare Krishnas. You guys are like this. 
it's, it's terrible. Ironic you're, not even, even... you're not even starting on a fair playing ground. You have to start almost, you're starting in negative numbers almost to try to dig your way out of a hole. So that yeah. being said, yeah. it's a new age. It's a new time. The devotees are newly organized and it's, it, it, things are much better now. Yeah, definitely. I, I, but I mean, we have to think about these new ways to spread the culture. And I think there's tons of new ways. Sometimes we get lost in the way Prabhupada did it like this, so it's got to be done like this. And I think that's short-sighted. And I think Prabhupada also exhibited a lot of flexibilities. Sometimes we do things like we have a Sunday love feast. Why are we calling it a Sunday love feast? I mean, for most part, that was like a term in the 60s that made sense. Now it sounds like a peculiar orgy, you know, uh, <laughs> that makes no orgy. sense. Or, you know, uh, uh, but Prabhupada called it that. So we think like this is like this sacred cow. We have to keep going and perpetuate the Sunday love feast. But fortunately, there's some de- so, there's so many devotees who get this and are, are, who are very progressive in the way they do it in the way they spread the holy name. And they do it from a genuine way. They really genuinely care about people. And that's why I think things are changing rapidly. And I, I truly believe, and Radhana Swami predicted it, and it's happening. There is a Hare Krishna explosion in New York right now and spreading all over America and Western Europe. And I'm just happy to be a little minion, a part of his vision. <laughs> I don't know about minion. You are probably the lead commander in his vision, if not more than that. <laughs> I'm like a little so, tiny gear. So I, I, oh, you know, I would love to continue the discussion. I, I also want to respect your time. How much time do we have? Or maybe we can continue in a future podcast. What would you prefer? Let's do five more minutes and then we can do again some other time. Sure. So you know, you're based in America, but I see uh, whenever you're in a podcast, you have a lot of people from Europe also. So how did that happen? Do you travel extensively in Europe or? Um, I travel. We have three. I find we have about three demographics. One is I'm a yoga teacher and I travel internationally when I teach. Okay. So whenever I teach, I mention the podcast and then people who are sort of dedicated students, they listen online or they listen via podcasts. Hmm. Um, the second is when we were musicians, we have fans that are still that got into bhakti from our music and they're still out there. Some took initiation, some took initiation in other uh, institutions, but they're all Krishna bhaktas and they're out there and they're sort of floating around. And so part of the podcast mission was to uh, corral all these people together okay, and assist, assist them on their path. And then um, another mission was for just plain devotees who want a sangha when they're driving to work. Um, and they can find some value there, but maybe they can't get to a temple or there's no temple near them. And then this other demographic arise uh, uh, arose, and that was people that just heard me on Joe Rogan or people that have heard me on another popular podcast called The Rich Roll Podcast I was on, which was a very um, a pretty popular podcast in America also. So what I find is this is the main demographic of our traveling. And my band traveled internationally. So we have people all over and okay. my teaching and also these two podcasts. So and then anybody else who just listens. So the wisdom of the sages podcast before that also, were you regularly teaching the Bhagavatam? It's, you said that in um, your, 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 you call yourself a preacher earlier. So even in your yoga classes, you would be, did you have some systematic structure of teaching the Bhagav- teaching bhakti also? Uh, yeah, I did. Well, I always taught it. Whenever I would teach a bigger class than I, I always teach it, even in my regular yoga classes, you're going to hear some Vedic truth and wisdom and chanting. But then when I do bigger, like tomorrow night, I'm doing a two and a half hour class. And so an hour of it will be all chanting and philosophy. And then an hour and a half of asana. And that's a oh. class that someone spends $45 to do. You know what I mean? They're, you know. And so um, then I'll do a training sometimes and I'll teach the, I'll teach Bhagavad Gita, 
Krishna Leela, Mahabharat. Um, and then I will do uh, um, I'm forgetting your question, but yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah. So always been teaching Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti and philosophy are always been teaching throughout. So in yeah. one sense, the wisdom of the Sages podcast systematized and spread your out, spread the what you were already mm -hmm. doing. Before it was a podcast, I was doing it online just for those demographics, um, the students and the old music people. And also, mm -hmm. by the way, the main person, the main demographic I'm really working on is myself. It gives me accountability to hear the Bhagavatam every day. And that's powerful. <sighs> yeah, this is the humility you were referring to earlier. This is what appeals it's not humility. It, I have a tendency. I'm very lazy. I have a tendency to be distracted. I have a tendency to keep a set of books on my bookshelf, but never read the books. So this forced me to read every day. So for about two years before we started the podcast, we were having some regular reading with me and some students. But now I take it a little more seriously because there's accountability. And that's the beauty of a community is that accountability. So in one sense, you could say that uh, the, what you have built to the wisdom of sages might be, might be the bhakti tradition's first virtual community. Isn't it? We talk about virtual outreach, but I don't know whether anybody has actually built a community where you know, the way I saw you, I don't, I don't you know. actually individually connect with people, greet everyone who is there by name, speak a few words about them. So I think those small <laughs> things make people feel valued, get a sense of belonging. And... So it's actually a community. It's not just a discourse. It's a community you're building. Well, you, well, we just had a picnic in Central Park, a Wisdom of the Sages picnic. Then we did a uh, Wisdom of the Sages weekend in New York City and then one in Los Angeles. And we're about to do a Wisdom of the Sages week-long retreat in Italy. Oh. And I tell you, some of these people, I see them in person. I was like, have we ever met in person? because I see you every day for like a year, but I can't remember if we've ever met or not. So yeah, it really is a real peculiar virtual community that I'm not even sure, have I met them many times? Have I met them once? Am I related to them? I see them every day, sometimes twice a day, because I do evening classes sometimes as well. Oh, that's amazing. So in one sense, what you said earlier about technology can be used for good or bad, I think you're fully using the internet to its potential to not just give people Krishna, but actually give them pathways to keep moving toward Krishna. Because in one sense, there are a lot of classes and a lot of lectures available. But I don't know whether a structured pathway in a community setting is available. This is remarkable. And uh, Thanks, Prabhu. You're kind. Yeah. I hope I'm not here boasting. Forgive me if I'm boasting. Oh, not I don't at all, Prabhu. Boast. <laughs> I tend to be a little bit arrogant. So forgive me. Oh, you, what you have achieved is uh, extraordinary, and I mean, it's 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 inspiring for all of us. Because I have also been trying to do some little Western outreach in my own way, but it's inspiring to see those who are beacons of success. So, Prabhu, all of our people love you. They all talk about the spiritual scientist. You're like a guru to them. I'm and just like a fly. That's probably because you, know, you have shaped them so that they appreciate whatever little good is there in me. I'm grateful that, for that opportunity to be of some, of some assistance in I, your I'm like a, I'm like the first step of a ladder. You can, they step on my head and then I lift them up towards you. You're on the top of the ladder. You know, but you first some of them, you got to step on somebody first. I'm good at getting stepped on and they can, when they step on me, then they get higher and they grab onto your feet and then they're saved. <laughs> I will take that metaphor. Yes. Your service attitude I have seen is they step on you, but when you get up, Krishna is expanding your size, size all the way. That's <laughs> as you rise, you will take them toward Krishna <laughs> and we can just give them a pat along the way. You're making me sound like Hanuman. And the only thing I have in common with Hanuman is I'm very hairy. Otherwise, there's not much comparison. 
और वो हनुमान वॉज फिजिकली पावरफुल यू आर फिजिकली पावरफुल हनुमान डेड एक्स्ट्रॉड इन सर्विस फॉर लॉर्ड राम यू आर ऑल्सो डूइंग दैट हनुमान इज ऑल्सो योगी इन सम सेंस इट सो यू आर ऑल्सो योगी सो इट्स अ ब्यूटिफुल मैटर फॉर प्रभु जनरली एट द एंड ऑफ अ पॉडकास्ट आई ट्राई टू क्विकली समराइज इन टू थ्री मिनट्स वॉट वी डिस्कस्ड कैन आई डू दैट एंड वी लैंड प्लीज प्लीज so today we discussed this top broad topic of from physical yoga to devotional yoga and then you started your journey of how being born in a christian family you already had some inclination for something higher so it was mainly through music it was uh, re- it was in a sense rebellious music that uh, was satvik so generally rebellion means rajas and tamas but he was mm. in the atmosphere rajas and tamas satva was rebellious and so you you talked about meaningful themes there and then from there you came to know about the hari krishnas then you came to you, you to some extent it is amazing that you had a musical band which uh, which already followed the four regulatory principles and is created what are the word you used created a stream within the stream or cre- uh, created a what was the word scene scene, scene within uh, the scene a straight straight people a straight edge yeah seen within mm-hmm. the scene yeah and then you met the devotees there itself but then you came to india on your journey and the radical difference between indian culture personalized indian culture what, what is it assembly line western culture was very personalized mm-hmm. indian culture and then so so then there you came back to from india to america joined the ashram and were there for some time but then the i think two three themes stood out to me was the first theme was just how you already had a very spiritually evolved bag spiritually inclined and evolved background second was how even through our going away from krishna not only will krishna draw us back but krishna will teach us things by which we can draw others towards him also so your expertise in your yoga martial arts all that you started using that and you did kirtans and that was beautiful and you became immediately you said in two days you sold out that is remarkable and then when we had this discussion about uh, how oh america is riper now for krishna for bhakti bhakti is cool vegetarian food is cool and so many things <laughs> community is cool satvik satva guna in general is cool in many different ways so bhakti is very ripe and there is a hari krishna explosion in the new york area and is spreading elsewhere also so for sure so, so where we we could say where we went wrong or what we can learn from the past is that we were very potentially big at one time in the western world also but three things like leading with ego instead of humility like appearing to be superior to others and then trying to use the means justify then justify the means that kind of attitude mm. and within that you know, going along with predefined definitions of success like say seeking book distribution points rather than getting people to read books so because of mm. that now sometimes we have to start with a negative score where we have to overcome the negative conceptions of people that people have about us right. and move forward but but this this combination also where you are you said you are very a uh, uh, broad gated approach at the same time upfront about what you are doing so that is also you, you don't hide that you are a bhakta if you are going to learn yoga from me you are going to get bhakti with it and still so if you the point you made is that if we are authentic if we if we have a passion for something we care for something then people also start caring for it we will find krishna will send us to people who will care who care for that and overall there is you know there is such a energy of optimism and positivity along with humility mm-hmm. that is there in, in just hearing from you and the wisdom of the sages podcast is amazing that you got i used to think that you are getting to yoga audiences but yoga audiences then musical audiences and the podcast audiences it's quite a diverse group and you have it's you quite have a diverse group yeah digital community virtual community builder in our movement and then you can actually have physical community also whenever you have some programs so oh, it's you will be one of the shining success stories of our movement in the 21st century and I'm you're very kind to have your association today and to hear your story and look forward to your book in future thank you my friend thank you very um, much the wisdom me. of the sages is the name of the podcast listen to it wherever you get podcasts 
And you have a beautiful, beautiful quality, Prabhu, in seeing the good in people. And I really appreciate that about you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prabhu, for your kind words. Jai Shri Krishna. Krishna.